another dimension, it is going to, as uh, the old King James said, in Job to the long home, the long home. And so even the, in the sense that Job understood some things about this, being an old patriarch, he understood these things too. God had revealed to him. And even though his body was racked with disease and his family attacked, in demonic ways and all of the struggle that uh, Job went through in the Old Testament, he still, in the end, he had kept his faith that there is a rich reward coming. And in his life, God repaid him many times over. But when he arrived in that beautiful home, and the journey to heaven was completed for Job. He saw all of his family there. He found a place like he could never imagine in his mind. Something only this world can give us a, a, a glimpse of. Something we will enjoy forever and ever and ever. Amen. <laughs> rich rewards, understanding salvation. Look in verse 20. He said, we know also that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know Him who is true and we are in Him who is true, even in His Son, Jesus Christ. He is the true God and eternal life. If anybody ever tells you the Bible does not teach that Jesus is God, you can open to 1 John 5. It's here. It's here. Scriptures teach this. John taught it over and over in his Gospel. It's here. They're lying. The world does not have this understanding. But according to John, he said the Son of God has given us an understanding. You see, there's a knowledge of His coming. That first coming. I'm not talking about the second one. But there's the knowledge of the first coming that's being given. And that is, who exactly was this man Jesus? Who was He? There was a knowledge given re related to Him. He's the Son of God. Even, remember, uh, even the soldier at the foot of the cross Surely this is the Son of God, he said. It's the main point of the lessons of John. The apostle was, was convinced of it. And on the island of Patmos, he saw, he saw the Lord Jesus there. The ascended and glorified Christ. Revelation chapter 1, he gives the picture, the vision he saw. He was certain all through his life and ministry, Jesus was the Son of God. He had this knowledge. He realized it was an understanding that had come from God. And you have to think, remember this. The understanding you have of Jesus Christ is not just what man has given you. It is what God has given you. God has given you. Think of the great gift. God has given you that understanding. Not just anyone understands that. But you do. God has given you that understanding. To resist and reject that understanding is to your own peril and danger. Because if we reject the Son of God, we have no other hope. God has revealed this. It's a gift that God has given to us. He said, uh, He's given, we know also, verse 20, that the Son of God has come and He's given us understanding so that we may know Him. We can know Him. Your Bible, from a, actually from Genesis all through, is a progressive revelation of how to know God. God dealt all throughout history in the Old Testament with the people of Israel. 
and periodically other nations, revealing Himself to them through different ways, different means. You read the stories. He sent prophets to His people over and over again that they might know the true God, that they might turn from their sins, that they might turn away from idolatry. But God was revealing Himself over and over again to His people. And finally, the prophets were silent. 400 long years between the prophet Malachi and the New Testament prophet John the Baptist. 400 long years of silence. No word from heaven. They had the Scriptures. They had the Old Testament laws. They had the miracles that occurred under the prophets' ministries and God's intervention into their lives. They had all of that to reflect on for 400 silent years. And then John the Baptist came. A voice crying in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, he said. Repent, because the kingdom of God has come. It's at hand. It's near. It's imminent. Repent. <coughs> And finally, the Lord Jesus came. And with the Lord's coming, we find a way to know God completed. It's full now. It's entire. The only way, Jesus said, to know God is through the Son of God. He's the way, the truth, and the life. No person can come to the Father except through Jesus. If we turn this knowledge away, <coughs> we're turning away our only hope to know God. It's knowing of the true God, not the false gods. The world with devils filled. The world is filled with these devils. False <laughs> teachings abound. <laughs> Somebody wonder, why are there so many false things? It's because they're motivated by evil spirits to draw people's hearts away from the true God. <coughs> Knowing the true God is the issue. Life in Him should be your greatest pursuit, the most important thing in your life. Life in Christ. <coughs> the Son is the true God. John said, and eternal life. Yet, one of the rich rewards of faith, the understanding that we have of salvation. Finally, and it's strange, but I had to include it. It's tagged on at the end of this great epistle. <coughs> Dear children, keep yourselves from idols. It must have been a great temptation for the readers of John's epistle. It must have been a great temptation. Their hearts being pulled away from worshiping the one true God and eternal life. Their hearts being pulled away from the message of the true gospel to false teachings. And that's where we started in, the, in this epistle. The false teachings that were so rampant and becoming very influential. Pulling God's people away from the truth. Little children, dear children, keep yourselves from idols. An idol is a substitute for the true faith. Even though an idol is a stone or wood or an image, a picture, an inulate, some kind of good luck charm, even though an idol may be these kind of things, they speak to people. They don't have to have words. They speak that God is not true. That God's Word is not the way. These idols and, and the practice of idolatry draws our hearts from the true God. And so they speak even though they're silent. An idol is a substitute for the true God. And the first of all commands is broken. Have no other gods before me. 
Number two, do not bow down to an idol or an image. Even in the great law of God, and John is in agreement with it, keep yourselves from idols. The world is full of idols. They're all around us. They'll come right into our home if we let them in. <laughs> if we allow them to stay, they'll take their position in our hearts. Be careful. Keep yourselves from idols. Amen. Amen. As we finish the gospel here, we want to pray, prepare our hearts for the communion table today. Take a moment to really think about what has been said. The rich rewards of faith and you enjoying them. The assurance of eternal life is a blessing of faith in Christ. The power of prayer, knowing God is hearing us, when we pray. Oh, that we can approach God. We can ask of Him. According to His will. We can carry on a ministry to others. Communion can be a time of really examining ourselves and thinking about ministry too to others. While you're taking a communion, the blessed time, thinking about our Lord Jesus and His sacrifice, God may bring someone to your mind who is in sin and He may want you to pray for them like no one else. That becomes your ministry. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, the rich rewards, so much you've given, given and given and given to us, the treasures of your word. more valuable than gold and silver, jewelry, property, lands and houses, more valuable than the finest cars or jobs, more valuable more than all this world could offer. What you've given, faith, prayer, Love. Your word. What you've given. Your son. His blood. The resurrection. How blessed we are. Your spirit has been given. Poured out. Abundantly on your people. Your spirit has been given joy, peace. How you bless this Lord. We're in your presence now. Help us, I pray.